You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Tuano was a little clearing in the eastern jungle of Ecuador where my daughter Valerie and I lived with a tribe of Indians called Aucas or Waurani. We lived there for two years, two out of the 11 years that I was a missionary in Ecuador. And I've had a good many years since then to reflect on that time. There's an epilogue to my book, The Savage, My Kinsman, which tells the story of those two years. The epilogue was written many years after we left Ecuador. And I had had opportunity to think and ponder about the things that went wrong, our failures, our successes, ambiguities, and paradoxes. All of us, as we look back over anything that we may have tried to do for God, anything that we may have tried to do for anybody, we will probably see paradoxes, contradictions, failures, some things we did right, some things we did wrong. Well, I want to read a little bit from that epilogue because I had to do a lot of thinking for a long time to put it into words. I wrote one novel about it, trying to transform the lessons of those years into a fictional form. That novel was called No Graven Image. We left the Alcas after two years for several reasons. One of them was Valerie's education. She was having a very tough struggle concentrating on school books when f small friends were always breathing down her neck and wanting to try out the crayons or the scissors, flipping through the picture books or begging her to go out swimming or hunting. It just got to be almost a physical impossibility. But then... There was another reason for my leaving, and I can't go into that in any detail, but I can say this much, that there were some significant differences between my missionary colleague and me, and the conviction grew that the clearing in Tuano was really too small to accommodate two missionaries who were not in any strictly truthful sense really working together. One of us, it appeared, must go. My decision was a painful one. Two opposite trends in current Christian thinking are dangerous. One is the sheer triumphalism which is the coin of much religious telecasting. Make it appealing, make it cheap, make it easy. Be a Christian and watch your difficulties dissolve. Obey God and everything you touch will turn to gold. The other is the expose. Out of a very muddy notion of something called equality, and perhaps also out of an exaggerated fear of hero worship or cultism, springs an urge to spy out all weaknesses and inconsistencies, and thereby discredit practically all human effort, especially when its intention is an unselfish one. We must recognize that as long as we are in these vile bodies, as Paul calls them, our attempts to offer salvation and life will be mixed with corruption and death. Because of the earnestness and obedience of five men, the Alka Indians were finally reached. But the men died. The world noted their death with awe, with cynicism, or with indifference. Some Christians were aroused to missionary responsibility. Nine children were left fatherless. The example of their fathers set for them, however, remains a strong and a noble one. Much that was true appeared in Christian publications regarding this story. So did much that was false. I was reported to have lost my mind, become an alcoholic, produced an alka baby. Rachel was, quote, massacred, unquote, by one reporter, she told me in a recent letter. Mission boards struggled over the question of territory, credits, priorities, promotion. Most of these disagreements were worked out. The Alcas heard the gospel. They also got polio. Some of them died from it. Others were crippled. Oil companies, more than a score, I'm told, have been able to enter what were formerly forbidden areas, so that the Indians now have tools, shortwave radios, hypodermic syringes and penicillin, helicopter pads, and hard hats. 
It's hardly necessary to point out that for every civilized blessing, there seem often to be ten curses. The hunting grounds on which the Indians depended for food are being systematically destroyed by the search for petroleum. How we long to point to something, anything, and say, this works, this is sure. But if it's something other than God himself, we are destined for disappointment. It's all going to cave in. There is only one ultimate guarantee. It is the love of Christ. The love of Christ. Nothing in heaven or earth or hell can separate us from that. And because God is God and loves us, he will not allow us to rest anywhere but in that love. We run straight to him when other refuges fail. Our misconceptions are corrected in him, our failures redeemed, our sins cleansed, our griefs turned to joy. But first, the life of Jesus must be manifest in our mortal bodies. First, the drama must be played out through suffering, weakness, failure, death, and resurrection. Jesus came not to make us comfortable by satisfying our whims and acceding to our wishes and our sometimes foolish hopes, but to cast fire on the earth, to bring a sword. The old prophet Simeon saw when Jesus was only eight days old that he was destined to cause the falling and the rising of many, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. To Mary, he promised a sword will pierce your soul. It's always hard to keep a single eye, to look at things spiritually, especially when they're a mess. There are times, I confess, when the whole Tiwano scene strikes me as high comedy, though I haven't forgotten the tears. Imagine us, two such different women, different from each other, positively freakish to the Alcas, with a small blonde girl, going into that hidden clearing in the forest, moving into one of those houses which didn't amount to much more than an umbrella, eating whatever handouts we could get, I drew the line at ants and grubs, having powdered milk, salt, oatmeal, even chocolate and cheese sometimes, dropped to us by parachute, Asking stupid questions, why the string, how come you have holes in your earlobes, etc. Putting ideas into their heads, for example, the wearing of clothes, the use of matches, aluminum pots, scissors, soap. Depending upon them for everything and thus becoming three nuisances. High comedy, I call it. We must not proceed from our own notions of God's action. It will appear that he has not acted. But we must look clearly and unflinchingly at what really happens and seek to understand it through the revelation of God in Christ. His life on earth had a most inauspicious beginning. There was the scandal of the virgin birth, humiliation of the stable, the announcement, not to village officials, but to uncouth shepherds. A baby was born, a savior and king, but hundreds of babies were murdered because of him. His public ministry, surely no tour of triumph, no thundering success story, led not to stardom, but to crucifixion. Things must be worked out according to a divine design and timetable. Sometimes the light rises excruciatingly slowly. I read that much to you from the epilogue of the savage, my kinsman, to remind us that discipleship always leads us way beyond our depth. The will of God is always bigger, always different, always far better than we could have ever dreamed. But in the meantime, we suffer, we sin, we fail, we're puzzled, we're bewildered. People are always asking me wherever I go, what has happened to the other four widows? Mary Lou McCulley has not remarried. She still lives near Seattle. She has three sons, all of them married. She has four grandchildren. Olive Fleming, 
married Walter Liefeld, a professor at Trinity Seminary in Deerfield, Illinois. They have three children, one of whom is married to a pastor. Barbara Udarian has recently returned to the States from Ecuador. She's been there up until a year or so ago. She's been living in Kansas City. She represents the Gospel Missionary Union, and she will be moving to Florida soon, I believe. She's got two children, both of them married. Her daughter Beth has four children. Marge Saint married Abe Vanderpoy, former president of the World Radio Missionary Fellowship. They have been with Back to the Bible in Lincoln, Nebraska. They do a great deal of traveling, still representing HCJB. Gateway to Joy, 132 Reflections on Life in Ecuador.